Uh, we are recording and you are good to go to start the presentation. Patrick, and welcome everybody to the Global Public Health Lecture Series, which is um, sponsored by the program in Global Public Health here at the University of Montana in partnership with the School of Public and Community Health Sciences and with the Institute of Health and Humanities. So I'm Kimber McKay, and I'm here as the Director of Global Public Health and to introduce this week's speaker, um, Dr. Gail Hood, who is um, joining us today from the East Coast. Dr. Gail Hood received his MD from the University of Michigan and completed his surgical internship and residency through Harvard University at Peter Bent Brigham Hospital and Boston Children's Hospital Medical Center. So to help bring medical care and surgical services to underserved areas of the developing world, Glenn also completed master's degrees in international affairs, epidemiology, health promotion, and disease prevention, and anthropology. He is still a professor of surgery at George Washington University Medical Center and is a member of numerous medical, surgical, and international academic societies. So Dr. Gelhood has led medical students, residents, and physicians on over 200 medical missions in Africa, Asia, South Pacific, and South America. And he founded the humanitarian outreach organization, Mission to Heal, about which he will speak today and about the purpose-built mobile surgical units transecting Asia, South America, and Africa, delivering healthcare and teaching indigenous healing capacities in some of the most remote regions of the world. So with that, I'll turn it over to our assistant Kelly, who will be running the slideshow, and that will be presented by our guest, Dr. Gailhood. Welcome. And thank you, Kimber, and thank you, Kelly, for being uh, my technical outreach program there. I really envy just being there in the big sky country. I can be alive there. I have a little more confinement here. I think we all have being on a two-dimensional screen. But after that very overgenerous introduction by Kimber, you were expecting a professor. You were expecting someone with a dozen graduate degrees. And what'd you get? A truck driver. Hey, I mean, we all do what we can. And as a consequence, I really thought I should come in, shall we say masquerade. Uh, you've all probably had quite enough of this so that since we are only speaking on a screen, I wanna say, I'll be happy to say, yes, I am very much as you are, very aware of our environment, the environment that we live in the global health, as your program is named, has a number of double entendres to it, and I believe in global health. That is the health of our globe, as well as the components within it. The enzootics that we are talking about, or the pandemics, seem to us to be startling aberrations. No, in fact, they are not. That's how we got to but where we are. Those viruses, got incorporated when well in ancient history into our genome to create us now. And as a consequence, we're gonna be talking about a couple of pandemics that are crossing the globe. No, I am aware that you are aware that there is one going on now, but maybe I can introduce you to another one that's bigger bigger, more urgent, and one that we can actually do a bit more about. And in fact, we don't need to do a lot of research about it because we already know what it is that can fix it. And some of those things that can be fixed require only political, humanitarian, or the goodwill of one person helping another. That is what I'm going to be speaking to you about. How do you get all the people in on the act and still get some action. How can you not just decry the problems in the world or say, I view with alarm, but perhaps a point with pride. One of those prides is listening, Carrie Pride. And I want to point out that she was with me on the mission to Mongolia. I'd like to have her and others report on what their experience was like and what it means to them. I'm going to show you a couple of the different aspects 
of the problem that I see and what are potential solutions for them? And then point out immediately, no, this is not the point with pride part of the view with alarm. Look at what I just did. Send us funds, do us honors, send us another certificate or another medal. My job is to work my way out of a job. I am a medical educator and my purpose for going is to have others do and do better what it is that I've learned over a half century in traveling in and out of at least this continent and a couple of the others. Mission to Heal has these mobile units in four continents at present and I hope to continue them and keep them going. What are they? They're educational units. I'd love to tell you the backstory about how it is that I happen to be driving a very unique machine here. But the purpose for doing this at all is to say to people who are in acute need, you ought to find your way to some source of help. Why don't we send you to a referral center, to the university hospital in the capital, 1500 kilometers away, where they speak a different language, there's a different tribal affiliation. They have a different religion. There's no family there to care for us. And besides, you know that the hospital doesn't have a diet kitchen. It doesn't have a nursing staff where they live. They rely upon their social environment. Montana is the kind of environment that I would love to be related to, both its external environment and also the social and the, the dynamic group that you are in global health. So let me identify for you a problem and then say, if Kelly, you can show me the next slide. It's only because in truth of advertising here, there's a group that is specifically related to this now that it's become known. And I just gave their keynote address and it's the Global St Surgery Student Association, although students have missed over because by now most of them are residents. And you can go on uh, Kelly and we'll tell you why it is that we're doing this. There are two people on this slide. Um, I will try to identify myself as one of them. The other one is rather the future. I have been the beneficiary of a whole lot of institutions. And as I did that, going from one to the other, I was able to take from them some of the things that might help us here to still more advanced care. Now, should I devote the rest of my life in Washington, D.C. as a very highly specialized tertiary care giver? I was the chief of transplantation for 40 years. I did all the ICU and advanced oncology from the National Cancer Institute. I might be able to advance perhaps another tenth of a percent the quality of care given here. You, on your first day, can increase by a hundredfold the environment in which these people are trapped. You can't fall off the floor. This is a place for you to find yourself in an environment where what you do really makes a difference. My residents say over here, they are so redundant. They are the fourth person back while everything they do has already been done and someone else is checking it to see if it comports with their own records, you're the first and last person to see some of the individuals that we'll be going to see. And as a consequence, we're gonna make sure that you do this carefully. We don't have the opinion that this is good enough for Africa. No, there's one standard of surgical care in the world and that is what I want for me or for my immediate family and that is going to be done over all kinds of barriers, social, economic, technologic. And what really is required is for us to learn from them. Three big lessons, how to take care of more people with far more serious problems with far fewer resources. And we are their students in that instance. And so we have to learn from them. So one of the organizations with which I work, which is a good story because part of your uh, humanities program here would relate to it. Their slogan is humanity 
with humility. I don't go there to say I'm here to shed light in the darkness. I may go there for them to enlighten some of my darker points and say, what is it that we can learn together that we can probably symbiotically help each other with? Why am I talking about this? And why are you listening to a surgeon? Although you do know I have an uh, epidemiology degree and a couple of interests in global health. A surgeon, isn't he an outlier? For a long time, the world looked at us that way. The World Medical Association and the World Health Organizations and the other things that were run said, no, 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 no. We can't expend that much human resources in a single individual. That's what operating is all about. One person caring for another. We need to do a multiplier effect. We need to clean up drinking water. We need to do an immunization program. We need nutrition. Yes, we do. We need to do that. But we don't get there by saying, all of those of you who are sick, you know, we can't be bothered. We should just let you go by the wayside because we're only here to take care of people to keep them from getting sick. How do we know whether that effectiveness has been there? How do we know that we have prevented a disease that hasn't even occurred? Proving a negative isn't very easy, as you well know. So let's go in and tell you what it is that the epidemic that you're standing in the middle of, Kelly. The one thing that we have to know now is that we are in the middle 2021, a unique period in human history. Yeah, you say 2020 was a big year, we had a pandemic. Well, nonsense. You know the pandemic has now occasioned the loss of maybe close to 400,000 Americans, maybe a million and a half people worldwide, and that there may be 24 million Americans affected by the disease. There may be at least five times the number of deaths in the hospital. There may be all that. And that still is trivial, not economically, not socially, not when you have the disease, compared to the major killers on the planet. Now, I used to identify those very clearly, and my students all respect that because I have to give them at least some kind of mnemonic for it. It's a damn shame. Diarrhea, acute respiratory, malaria, measles, and malnutrition are the number one through five causes of death on planet Earth. None of those need a lot more research to find out what causes them. And the means that we have to both treat and prevent them are in hand. So there have been very big primary care programs that have gone into them. The Millennium Development Goals have been highly successful. In fact, it's not a very well-known fact that a great number of people on planet Earth have been pulled out of poverty through those Millennium Development Goals and other forward progress on the planet. Are there a couple of those for which people are crying for some help and their resources have been denied? Yes, one of them. Here it is. This is a brand new concept for a lot of people in public health. Not so brand new for the people that are critically involved in it, such as the World Bank. The former director, Dr. Kim, comes up with the following statement and I'm going to reassert uh, it now in a different fashion. Because of the advances in Millennium Development Goals and other things, the majority of acute human loss of life and morbidity. Now that plagues and pestilences have been somewhat controlled, are conditions amenable to surgical care. And to date, very few public agencies have gone out and said, we're gonna do something about surgical care. And that's why we are doing something to develop surgery and also its uh, development in the indigenous population. So I am saying, my goal is to work my way out of a job, indigenize care. So we have an educational institution and what it does is it floats all boats. Of course, we come around and do an operation that involves an individual that we're taking care of. But I never do that without a trainee. They must be there so that they carry on when we leave. Second, that individual that's being operated on, we have curative care in order to emphasize the credibility of prevention. I can say to the folk, look at what I can do. This is a thyroid 
to me for a big goiter. It's an operation you can do, and believe me, you don't want this operation if it can be avoided. And so I have the largest iodine repletion program going simply because I do thyroidectomy on goiters. And I would like not to instill this in a whole population to continue the surgical technique, but to teach them how to manage it. And in order to prevent it, we must have curative care. They rest hand in glove, Kelly. So let us look around the globe and ask, what can we do with respect to surgical care since that seems to be the missing piece right now in many of the public health programs? You know, there's a huge push for certain endemic diseases. We've got a very large presidential initiative for malaria. We've got the PEPFAR program. We've got the AIDS relief and rehabilitation. Now we can take care of these folks. And everyone has said, no, we can't afford surgical care because that's too much of an investment in a single individual. Well, if liver transplantation is your model, how about obstructed labor? How about a strangulated hernia? Compare that to the annual cost for the highly active antiretroviral drugs for AIDS relief. And that is a treatment that continues for the duration of the person's life. A surgical operation is something magic. A patient and a disease part company and they can go about their lives. The women caring for children, uh, both men and women in labor, the student learning, all of this can be interrupted from something that has inhibited their lives. And that's why we are asking in the whole of the global surgical care, which raises the nutritional programs, the maternal and child health programs, especially when our surgical care is focused on those urgent procedures that are life-saving and debility preventing. At least three of those five relate to safe motherhood. DNC, ruptured ectopic, and cesarean section. Those are part of everyone's vocabulary out there. And I add the strangulated hernia and the fixation of uh, open fractures. Kelly? So we're gonna ask then, what are the needs out there and what are the resources that can address them? There are 2 billion people that have no access to surgical care. What does that mean? In Sub-Saharan Africa, if you have a strangulated hernia, you have a one in 28 chance of seeing a healthcare person. I did not say surgeon, I did not say doctor, I did not say nurse, a healthcare person who will understand that that is a significant problem that must be relieved in order to save your life. Next, Kelly. And now let's look at what that burden of disease happens to be. If you are not telling uh, people who are unfamiliar with the daily, uh, you all understand the disability adjusted life years. If you spend a couple hundred thousand dollars in the last four weeks of life in the ICU, which is where most of our Medicare dollars are spent, that does not improve the quality of life and humanitarian yield as much as fixing a child with a congenital abnormality who might then go on for another 80 years of disability relieved life. So let's qualify both lifetime and disability degree. And the product of that, we look around the world and we say, where are the dailies the largest burden? The burden of illness is largest where the resources are scarcest. And I don't have to identify for you on the map here why it is that I become an Africanist in the last half century, having gone to that continent more than once a year. And the reason for that is the disability adjusted life year yield from any procedure done is immediately apparent, but more importantly, that training for others to carry it on gives a multiplier effect where that's much greater. So now let's look at where those resources are, Kelly. Where? No, they're in the first world. Look at North America, look at Europe, look at some parts of South America. Doing pretty well. We are first, or if you call it second world, where the resources are equal to the need or 
for two reasons, either because the economy is developing or the birth uh, rate is in control, the standard of living rises. The first world, there's a standard of living rise where the, uh, the gross domestic product is either exceeding the population growth. In the second world, they are rather stable. In the third world, with even a rise in the gross domestic product, if the birth rate exceeds that, you have a decrease in the quality of life for each of those individuals. So our job is twofold. One is economic, to give those people a chance, which does two things. It increases and enhances their life. But secondly, it also limits the number of offspring they have, because you know that in order to have two children graduating from Harvard, it is not going to be economically possible to do that with a group of 22 of your offspring. And as a consequence, both of those things come together and that it is most likely that in order to get control of the burden of disease, we must enhance the human potential, the greatest tragedy of human life is the loss of that potential. If I may give you one Victorian essayist who said, the real tragedy of human life is not so much what men suffer, but what they miss. And how can we enhance, how can we make a humanitarian potential possible for these individuals, Kelly? And I'm gonna ask a couple of different ways. We try to get a collaborative learning experience. And the learning experience that I have is not transactional. And someone else has uh, surveyed a couple hundred, uh, no, 2,200 of the volunteers who have gone with me over the last uh, decades. And in a survey, none of them said, I learned a lot. That is so obvious it needs not saying. The majority, in fact, almost all said something like, my whole life is changed. I will never be the same. Did you feel that way after your first day in biochemistry? Did I get that by learning about Drosophila uh, genetics? Probably not as likely as watching a patient in a disease part company and a woman who is unable to feed her children now rise out of that poverty. That woman not only learning but enhancing the life of others around her. One of the things that I find startling is that I have students with me. They're freshman students in medical school or in veterinary school or in public health school, and they all have taken a couple of courses. They got biostat behind them. I'm, I'm gangbusters now. And they come in there and they find a, what I call subcultural giant, a woman. Her husband died of this bizarre wasting disease. She doesn't know what, but she had nine births and has three living children. And this learner that's come with me from the first world looks at her and is just so frustrated. What can I do? I can't handle I, Yeah, I graduated from gross anatomy and biochemistry and physiology, but how do I take it? And the woman looks at them and says, through the translation, how can I help you? All the wind comes out of the spinnaker. No, you don't understand. We came here to help you. No, 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 obviously there's one woman there who can cope and she has been able to manage by getting along with the resources she has and with the network of relationships. She may not have a lot of stuff, but she's willing to share. So both of us are learning. I don't go out there and say to the folks, today we're gonna to give you 15 different new things that you're gonna learn. We go there and say, what can we look at together and how can we pick up from you those pointers that you're ahead of us on? Next. So how can we do that? We can expect these people to come to an operating room. We bring the operating room to them. I would love to tell you that these are platforms that have come from an unusual background. Maybe I'll give you that very brief story only to tell you if ever you were looking for a plow, <laughs> made from a sword. These were the platforms from which the Pershing missiles 
of the theater nuclear force were arrayed against the armored divisions of this ex-Soviet Union aimed at Eastern Europe and the US through NATO put out the theater nuclear force that could obliterate multiple cities with a single missile that's merged multiple independently targeted reentry vehicles. All of which in the era of Gorbachev and Reagan, they came together halfway at Reykjavik I went there, actually uh, had been a witness, and Gorbachev said he didn't want to maintain a 1.2 million man army facing Eastern Europe along with World War II technology, and he would melt down the tank divisions if only NATO would stand back with that theater nuclear force which was threatening him. And so they were brought to Johnson Island, Hawaii and incinerated, and I snapped up the man cats, the platform from which the greatest threatened World War II equivalents and each one of those missiles was destroyed. And now they are the humanitarian outreach arm to teach surgical care in the most remote regions. They will go anywhere. They are unstoppable. We don't need bridges. We go through the rivers. They are making their own power solar. They make their own water. We can take the Congo River and push it right through the uh, reverse osmosis, the uh, components are brought through ultraviolet filters and then they are reinfused with salt and sugar to make IV fluids. We can take the perspiration out of the air. They are hyper-pressurized such that no dust and insects come in. In my operating room, a mosquito would be a nuisance. In that operating room, that mosquito can kill an anesthetized patient. So as a consequence, these are adapted to go anywhere and have triple point failure systems in them, Kelly. That means for every system, there's not just one, but two backup systems. And what we wanna do is institutionalize this. That's why I'm delighted to be talking of all places in a spot that understands the world more than the city people here that I have around me that don't know that the world doesn't look like an urban tertiary care institution it looks more like some of the parts of Montana that make me gasp just to look at them and their beauty. Yes, these are beautiful places. They're all so impoverished. And so we wanna leave a global healthcare legacy there that includes all the basic components that you're already talking about. And we all know about them. We also know about contagions, plagues and pestilences. And we have come better equipped to handle those and with the expanded program of immunization, the nutritional programs, with the maternal and child health programs, we're making progress. We can't then turn around and say, we don't care that you're rupturing your uterus. We can't manage to handle your strangulated hernia while you're vomiting fecal material because we only deal with programmatic things like uh, drug resistant tuberculosis. No, 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 these are individuals. You can't turn one away because they don't fit in a preventive program. It's too late to talk about, I think you'd be a lot better off if you'd worn your seatbelt before the collision. That's not only fatuous, it's cruel. And as a consequence, we must address that which we are given and not design the world to my specifications before entering it. Kelly? So we are looking here at three objectives we have. First, we offer opportunities to the people in Montana in the first world environment in every conceivable application of your skills. Global health, nursing, veterinary, uh, epidemiology, medicine, uh, almost all aspects. And I don't exclude things like dentistry. And we bring the first world to the third world and we take those people and bring them. And so there's a constant intersection of uh, each of them, Kelly. The second objective is that we give educational opportunity for us to uh, associate down there. You'll see me here in the middle of the Amazon with our mobile surgical unit there in Ecuador. And I'm telling you, I'm not casually involved in this. This is not something that I do as a hobby. Witness the fact that there are twin grandsons of mine there that are taking on this burden. And next to me there is Edgar Rodas, son of my colleague, former Minister of Health of Ecuador. And we are trying 
to merge our two institutions such that depending on the season, depending on the available resources, we will have a third world country assisting a third world country. There won't be any colonialism there. We didn't come to take over Africa from Ecuador and vice versa. And I didn't say, oh, this is an elite experience for me. Uh, I only go where there's air conditioning and my twin grandsons are there. Number three, Kelly, we partner. We don't do this alone. And Carrie is gonna notice immediately that we are in Mongolia. Here we've taken on the Ulaanbaatar Railway, the largest employer in Mongolia, and tried to use its facilities to move patients to tertiary care centers that might need it, but moreover to have those very specifically out in the periphery, better trained to take care of them. So I went to what was once called Outer Mongolia, now called Zafkan Province, 2,800 kilometers, I did not say on a road, but over the steppe. And then we've affiliated with the railheads of the Ulaanbaatar Railway and moved those patients back and forth on four successive travels. That's Mongolia, but we can say the same pattern for other parts of Asia. Next, Kelly. So we do what we need to do where it needs doing. And that means we are literally on the edges of surgical civilization. Here you see the units coming up over the scarp of the Great Rift Valley, that great tectonic cleft in the globe. You're sitting there looking at magma before the earth was born. There's a fascinating uh, recent jigsaw puzzle put together in almost real time by magnetometry showing how the continents came apart. And that is happening in real time as we're there. At the same rate your fingernail grows, those plates are shifting. We adapt to conditions on the ground. We don't say we want to create a, a George Washington University Medical Center. I'll say it only because I'm familiar with that or we can put Mayo Clinic in a place like that because it's unsustainable. We use those conditions there and we want to ensure the well-being of all involved. We are obviously careful about our PPE. We don't expose anyone to uh, viral diseases that are even more worrisome. And we are constantly uh, doing some preventive work along with our curative work. Next. So we put fulfillment of the mission way ahead of anything about our institution. I'm not here to plug mission to heal. There are other groups that are trying to do this as well. We've been doing it longer and we've probably got a little more advanced surgical parts to it, but we've actually been asked by those others. Could we partner with them? And a couple of them asked, though, no, can you take us over? Because with the pandemic, we've crushed uh, our own resources here because we are largely doing it to promote the institution rather than doing it. I don't really care who gets credit. Let's get it done. So we serve people in need and we do this without asking what language do you speak? Are you a Sunni or a Shia? Are you a Republican or are you one of these nasty things we've heard about called a communist? Are you able to pay? That doesn't enter it. And it's amazing how triage becomes simplified when we don't have some of those barriers that we bridge. And we focus on the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is not just the cured patient, but the curer of that patient with students of his own. So we don't go to a mission and say, isn't it wonderful we got something started here. We're gonna come back every year here to the same place. No, in the first time we get at least the opportunity to teach surgical technique, sterile technique. I mean, most of those people will pick up something off the floor with their gloves, thinking that the gloves are there to protect them. And then we talk about those first five essential operations that are urgent. On the second mission, we take the graduates of that program and bring them to the next level and talk about those things such as thyroidectomy for goiter. We talk about obstetric disasters, vesicovaginal officially, for example. And we talk about those things that reveal uh, orthopedic abnormalities. And we don't say we're coming to a third mission to do the same thing. We don't repeat, but I will go back a third time to the same place if 
they identify an environment just like they were at our first visit. And they will take the lead on creating a daughter clinic. We will assist them in that, creating an internal network. They don't have to wait for a 17,000 mile supply chain to get advice. One of the wonderful things about our very fancy surgical units is not just the fact that they can deliver care, but I have telemetry for monitoring and mentoring. We can continue the educational process from a distance. Kelly? We are on the edge. We don't go to the central city and say, I think I'm going to the tertiary care because it looks a lot more like mine than my hospital and the one that you've got here. Here you see me barreling through the Somali desert. In fact, we kick up sand as high as the camel caravans that come through with about 200 camels or more. And the units make it. We are in very good condition because they are air conditioned and have a high pressure system such that the air and sand penetrates it. But we get there and use them in environments where there will be people who are trained to continue when we go. Next. And we will never operate alone. My job is not to deliver care. My job is to enhance caregivers. So I will not do this without an indigenous partner. Our first world partners are always gonna be with us to help us through that, Kelly. And so you'll see the inside of my units here include people like Tobias here who envies me. He says, my goodness, this man has 12 graduate degrees. He's just the most amazing item. Tobias only speaks 13 languages. So he's gone with us to multiple areas and becomes our trainee who is now our trainer. So every one of these people are able to carry on with the chain so that they get confidence. We enhance the prestige of those who are there, Kelly. And this is that component that I call not transactional. We didn't learn 16 new things today. Our whole life is changed. We have a new way of looking at things. Now I understand why I got involved. Now I know what I want to do. Now I know this is no longer what I happen to be good at. It's a calling that I want to get better at. Next. So we have partnerships. This is the humane African mission. Humanity with humility. I have a hundred of these partnerships because my job is to make them look a lot better. And if we can do that, then there will be local resources. Kelly? Now, I want to give you, from my anthropology background, this delight because I'll show it to you in a couple of different areas. Uh, these are some Bodo women. Uh, we are doing this as an antenatal clinic, and this is what we would have any one of you coming on into, a global health project that involves a block. Typically, it's a month, and that month would have a node in the middle of two weeks for an international airport, because often people come for two weeks, and one cycle's out, one cycle's in, and we will swap that off. We always have a field coordinator, so you don't have to know when it is that you're going to be eating and what it is that you're going to find, because someone will take care of that for you. And we have a medical lead that is almost always I until I have someone who is able to carry on after that, which is before the end of the mission. And we have at least uh, multiple locations in each one of those two weeks. We'll never spend four weeks in one spot. And we try to bring them up to speed with eight to 15 volunteers each. Kelly? And as we do this, we are trying to speak vowels not just consonants. When I was a kid, I had this machine and it uh, took spoken speech and it put it into consonants in which you get this uh, flow of information which you can understand the content, but you have no idea how I feel about it. It's monotone. Or you can turn it down to the vowels. And in the vowels, you don't understand anything of the content, but for the feeling that comes across. Yes, we're going to take care of you. Your son will be better. And as a consequence, we must speak that not only there, but here, Kelly. And I have then this indigenous team, as you see the inside of my mobile unit, who are 
not just saying it's wonderful to work inside here. I've never been in air conditioning before. They're not saying, oh, we got lots of stuff. We can be American. We can throw away everything that we've got and reuse nothing. No, carefully recycling things and carefully, they have to use ingenuity and improvisation daily. And that they're teaching us in these tertiary care units. Kelly? I'm giving you a woman here who's in front of you. She's wearing PPE every day of her life on the street. She is displaced three times over. Her name is Sabra Akil, and I'm in Somaliland. I was the first to be in Somaliland, which is invisible uh, in the world. I know you all have heard about Black Hawk Down and Somalia and the Council of Judicial State, all of these things and the pirates. This is Somaliland, a former British colony adjacent to that former Italian colony. And as a consequence, Somaliland is invisible, not a member of the UN. I've been there now over the course of the last 20 years. And here's Sabra Akil, who's three times removed. First of all, a female surgeon? Come now. In an Islamic society, that may not be true. She is Yemeni, a refugee. Her two brothers are political prisoners, and one of them is unknown uh, as to where his whereabouts are. And third, she is trying to teach the males here, which I find very interesting, and I'm trying to enhance that. But she cares about these people and is working hard to teach them. And I am sponsoring her as we go from one little procedure to another. This is the inside of my mobile unit, right? We're doing simple little things like lipoma excisions, right? No, I'm assisting Sabra in the first parotidectomy in Somaliland history. We have brought each of these others up to doing cholecystectomies. We have done hysterectomies and the like all in our mobile unit, as you see here, Kelly. And here's the mountain, right? Mount Nebo, right behind the area of, this is called a gob. It's a small hut with a dome shape to it because this is the Great Rift Valley, which is a wind tunnel. That's why the great wind farms are there to harvest the wind energy from it. And so they need to be low, honey. And so Rose, who's one of my nurses, started as a midwife there, is from the area. Is, those are her cousins and aunties that she's taking care of. And she said for the first time in her life since she was in school, she was thrilled with learning because medical science was such a dynamic thing. There's always something new to learn. And as a consequence, as we climbed Mount Nebo as a two week holiday after the completion of the mission, I came out back down and what she had done is planted a grove that we watered. It's the Mission to Heal Commemorative Grove. And on there is a plaque that says, we pledge that every new patient will be treated better than the last ones. And we continue to pledge for constant improvement. And every week we will have the death and complication conference that you have suggested that we must have. And we will have tutorials daily. This is what we try to leave behind. And Rose is the finest product that we have. I would say, when I look at those acacias and the, and the low hanging cloud cover at the beginning of the rainy season, the environment in which she is inserted is the most instructive one for us to come and learn from. And she's commemorating us, teaching her. Next. I'm going to say that a lot of people come clustering, usually after the fact. Most of the politicians come and say, we'll take full credit for what you started. We didn't even know you were coming. But let a thousand flowers bloom. Let everyone who wants to get in the action and help us out. On my um, right side there and your left uh, is Rafael Sepulveda, to whom I'm going in uh, next week in Monterrey, Mexico, to do our American transect down through Central America with the brand new units. And so he is in Uganda with a South American non-colonial approach. We're taking care of the patients that look identical in each instance. Next except for the non-identical component parts. James is doing his first hernia repair. What a thrill he has. And I wanna say it might've been faster as he said, if you do it. And I wanna say, but it won't last as long unless you do it. Next. And here's what I wanted to tell you about with respect to how we can move about. It's not easy, but it is possible in environments that are not typical. Um, friendly to outsiders, they are more than welcoming the indigenization of care. Kelly? 
And even those that we cannot treat, for example, this young lady I find has a very large abdominal tumor and it looks to me like it's probably a neuroblastoma. Having been originally from the National Cancer Institute, having set up the Ugandan Cancer Institute, which is an affiliate of it, and the University of Washington runs their oncology program, which I had just visited on the way in in Kampala, we pick her up and carry her forward with us. So this isolated, remote, rural girl has the chance to live where otherwise there would be absolutely no one to recognize nor treat. And so, we don't need to take care of every problem, but we can help find the solution to it. Next. And this is the glory of it. I don't think your waiting room probably has too many goats wandering around in it, but the fact is that is not what my focus is. First of all, you see the bush toothbrush, tearing a particular twig off a bush, uh, a very special kind of bush gives you a toothbrush. But no, if I were literate enough, I'd be able to translate for you. I can tell you by taking one glance at this woman, is she married or is she not? How many children does she have? How many of those children are male? Is she the third or the fourth wife? These are people that communicate across language barrier where they're elaborate. She's not doing this on the basis of her visit to me. This is her daily dowry that she wanders around. It shows that she is a person of worth in her community. It's an anthropologic feast. I love it. And every day, this is the most intensive learning experience. I'm not taking you across a boundary of political. I'm not taking you across economic. I'm not taking you across a place that has a different religion. I'm taking you outside your comfort zone. That's where I live. And that's where Actually, it's most intense. And from that, I'm going to say, yes, indeed. I will open it to your questions. And thank you very much, Gary. I'm wondering if anybody um, would like to click over and unmute themselves and ask a question um, directly to Dr. Um, Gilhood. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Can I can hear? indeed, Thomas. Yeah. Um, how do, how do you finance this, if I may ask? It's never easy, and it is mostly on a basis of having our contributions made by the contributor. In other words, uh, students, we have put together a fund, and the fund will supply some part in subsidizing them, not the whole of it. In fact, everyone should have skin in the game, and so what I usually do is buy 10 tickets and I pay for them with a single uh, note and say, everyone is allowed to contribute to the degree that they can. I don't wanna know who paid 150%, who paid 50% because we're all on the same trip. So that yes, we get uh, fundraising by each of our contributing volunteers to the degree that they are able and then subsidize the rest. There is no, uh, government, there is no otherwise. And that's what Mission to Heal is trying to do right now to institutionalize it so that when I'm not doing it directly, there may be still some sources that might help. And in fact, I point out that other than the airfare, it's not that expensive. And so that's why I try to get a bargain group of airfares together and collect it in, uh, at a single time. So I would say that it is <laughs> maybe one 50th of the cost of a three hour course in my institution. And uh, as a consequence, most folks find it quite nice to go home and ask their parents for the Christmas present of their ticket fare. Thanks, Tom. Other questions? If, uh, if there isn't another question just yet, I might ask you an additional one, which is um, how do you pick the locales and do you have, a, do you have a, a system for that or do they come, do they ask you or how does that work? Yes, Tom, and I say never have I gone anywhere uninvited. They have to be buying into this. It is not something we impose on them, it's something they request. Number one, 
priority is the capacity for indigenization. I will never go anywhere as I just had a request. Would I please come to a spot in Ghana? There are no trainees, there is no, but they have a great need. So would I come and do 25 operations a day as free surgical care? What do you think the market, the insatiable demand is for free services from a professor from abroad? That is an insoluble problem. I am only going there if there is a capacitance left behind. Because if I go and do something, then the people there are aware that they didn't have to live all their life with a cleft lip. They didn't have to go around with a tailpiece of quino vera, that's called foot. They didn't have to do that. Now, they're much more frustrated when the parachute is pulled and out we go. As a consequence, we never go anywhere that we cannot leave behind some of the skill. And therefore, that would be the first requirement. So we don't go to dump care on any group. We are there to enhance the care they already give. And the second is, have we been there before? And are they ready to take on the next level? We don't repeat the mission. As I said, we go from graduation one, two, and three. And if we've gone from graduation two, it's only that they then take on the burden of helping another get up to level one. And so we will help in indigenizing a network. So we will do that three times. After that, the monitoring and the mentoring of the telemetry is what they will get because there are too many requests from too many places. I don't wanna take on a group and adopt it as my personal hobby because then they will simply say, great, we're gonna save up all the cases until you're here next year. And that is not the way to indigenize skill. Remember, I can. Uh, there are some organizations that get on the television and say, send us money because we fixed 35 lips or, or done 120 operations. My last mission, I wanna tell you 128 operations were done and I, did none of them. And the last four I assisted without putting on gloves. Thank you so much, Glenn. We are unfortunately out of time. It's been fascinating and such a fresh and interesting perspective on the work that you do and um, the sector in general. So thank you for that. On I your to... list, you've got some additional reading material if you want to follow through. Or in addition, on the slides, there's my website, missiontoheal.org. It's easy. But in addition, you can learn about the future prospects and plans. And in addition, the further slides on our uh, PowerPoint are the missions that will be coming from 2021 on. So anyone who wishes to learn more about that or to uh, join on in, support either virtually or in the reality when the travel restrictions are relaxed. Sorry about that, someone came to the door. So <laughs> I think we're gonna have to sign off for today. Thanks again, Glenn, um, it's been such a pleasure. And I just wanted to remind people that next week we're on break due to the holiday, President's Day holiday. And the following week, which is February 22nd, we will welcome Dave Citron from UW. Um, he is doing a presentation on his decades long work in Western Nepal. And um, his talk is entitled, What's in a Name? Public-Private Partnerships in Nepal's Health Sector. And he'll be reflecting on the importance of partnering with the Ministry of Health in Nepal and the significance, at least in his work, of integrating fully with the government health infrastructure in that setting. So that's something I'm really looking forward to. He's got quite a story to share about um, the phase over and exit that they tried to enact through the organization that he worked with from its um, earliest days and, um, and how that unfolded. So we have that to look forward to. So that will be two weeks from today. Thanks everybody for coming. And again, Glenn, thank you so much for sharing your insights and your experiences and for all of the excellent questions. Thank Bye you for now. Thank you.